What is a filter? This is a filter. So is this. This is a filter. Well, it's an audio interface, but it has a filter. It has an anti-aliasing filter built in to filter out frequencies over the Nyquist limit. This is a filter. This is a filter, but not the one that we're interested in. So do we have an understanding of what a filter is? By an incredibly broad definition, any medium through which a music signal passes can be regarded as a filter. However, we do not usually think about something as a filter unless it can modify the sound in some way. The different vowel sounds in speech are produced by changing the shape of the mouth cavity, which changes the resonance and hence the filtering characteristics of the vocal tract. Every microphone has a pickup pattern, so speaking into the front of the microphone has different filtering characteristics when compared to speaking into the back of a microphone. There are also examples of undesirable filtering, such as uneven reinforcement of certain frequencies in a room with bad acoustics. But when you think about it, everything is a filter. But really what we're interested in, in this series, are digital filters. An algorithm or computation which takes one sequence of numbers, which is the input signal, and produces a new sequence of numbers, which is the filtered output signal. Generally, the amplitudes of the different frequencies of the signal are modified by the filter, and in consequence, in most cases, would modify their phase relationships as well. So, to visualize the frequency changes that are imparted by a filter, we need to analyze a frequency response graph. The frequency response graph shows how a filter modifies the frequency content of a signal. The frequencies are plotted logarithmically on the x-axis, and the relative output amplitudes of the frequencies in decibels on the y-axis. There are plenty of different types of filters, but let's look at a fundamental one, a low-pass filter. It allows low frequencies to pass through it while attenuating higher frequencies. Here, you can see that the filter starts attenuating frequencies around this area. And this region is determined by the cutoff frequency. Technically, it is the frequency at which the attenuation is negative 3 decibels. For this reason, it's also called the negative 3 dB frequency. In this graph, the cutoff frequency is 500 Hz. The frequency band up until 500 Hz is called the pass band, and the frequencies above it are called the stop band. As you can see, the cutoff frequency doesn't just cut off all frequencies above it, but rather rolls off the frequencies. In this plot, the roll-off slope is gradual. The slope of the roll-off is measured in decibels per octave, meaning how many decibels of attenuation happens in each octave in the stop band. In this plot, we can see that at 1 kHz, which is one octave above our cutoff frequency of 500 Hz, we can see that the total attenuation is negative 6 decibels. And at 2 kHz, which is another octave up, it's negative 12 decibels. So we can characterize the roll off for this filter as negative 6 decibels per octave. This is coincidentally called a first order filter. The order of the filter determines the steepness of the slope. So a second order filter would have a roll off of negative 12 decibels per octave. A third order filter would have a roll off of negative 18 decibels per octave, and so on. We'll see where this order terminology comes from later on. I am simplifying the filter characteristics on a need to know basis here, really. For filter orders higher than one, we'll have to deal with pass band ripple and stop band attenuation, but we'll not be looking at those characteristics in this series. We can quickly hear what a low-pass filter sounds like and put these terminologies in practice. For an audio signal, we'll first use a white noise source, which is random noise whose frequency distribution is uniform across the audio spectrum. We'll then apply a second-order low-pass filter with its cutoff frequency as 500 Hz. We can see that when the cutoff frequency is set to 500 Hz, the attenuation that's displayed by the Reaper EQ for 500 Hz is around negative 3 decibels. And at 1 kHz, we can see that the attenuation is around negative 12 decibels. 
since 1 kHz is exactly 1 octave above 500 Hz, this makes the roll-off slope to be negative 12 decibels per octave, which in turn makes this a second-order low-pass filter. Let's try out a couple of single sinusoidal tones. I, I have a tone generator which is placed before the EQ and a peak meter after the EQ. Starting at 100 Hz, we can see that no attenuation takes place and the 100 Hz signal is passed through with no change in amplitude. At 500 Hz, we can see that the output signal has been reduced by negative 3 decibels. At 1 kHz, the output signal has been attenuated by negative 12 decibels and at 2 kHz by negative 24. As expected for a second order low pass filter. The frequency response graph is quite intuitive, right? It shows us the gain or attenuation of different frequencies that passes through the filter. Another important aspect of filters is the phase response. And similar to frequency response, we have a phase response graph. The frequencies are plotted logarithmically on the x-axis and the relative shift in phase of the frequencies in degrees on the y-axis. This curve is the phase response of the first order low pass filter. This is not so intuitive from first glance and doesn't lend itself to be very useful or insightful but becomes a valuable tool once we begin to understand more. We can see that the cutoff frequency of 500 Hz has a phase shift of negative 45 degrees. This means that if a 500 Hz sinusoid is passed through the filter, the output signal will be out of phase by 45 degrees, or in other words, delayed by an eighth of its wavelength. For a second order low pass filter, the phase response is quite similar, it's just that the amount of phase shift seems to be doubled. Another way to visualize this would be through the time domain. So far, we've looked at audio visualized in the frequency domain, which may or may not be intuitive for you. So this section will pretty much be the same as above, but wholly visualized within the time domain. Let's say that we have four sinusoids of different frequencies, amplitudes, and starting phases. But for simplicity's sake, I'm just gonna keep their amplitudes the same and their starting phase as zero. Adding these sinusoids together will give us a complex waveform. If you can combine or synthesize a waveform using simple sinusoids, then it makes sense that it should work the other way as well. And it's true. Fourier mathematically showed that any complex waveform can be broken down or decomposed into a distinct set of sinusoids of different frequencies, amplitudes, and phases. So it's a reversible process. So let's say you pass this waveform through the first order low pass filter that we were talking about earlier. We'd get a filtered output signal, which is more or less a smooth version of the input signal. And we'll talk about why that's the case. If we apply Fourier decomposition, we'll get a set of sinusoids that it's made up of, and we'd get something like this. The fundamental frequency doesn't seem to have altered at all and every harmonic after the fundamental seems to be attenuated with decreasing amplitudes as they go higher in frequency. Moreover, the starting phase seem to be altered for the harmonics as well, with a larger phase shift noticeable for higher frequencies. This is entirely congruent with the frequency domain analysis that we saw. The higher, frequency, the, higher the frequency, the lower its amplitude, and the larger the phase shift. Since the high frequency components are diminished after filtering, we get less spikes in the output signal, since the spikiness in the time domain is caused by high amplitude, high frequency partials. That's one of the reasons that a low pass filter is also called a smoothening filter. If you have an erratic control signal and want to smoothen it out, a simple choice would be to go for a low pass filter with an appropriate cutoff. So we've learned what a filter is and what it does and how to observe what it does. But why does it do what it does? The fairly obvious questions that you may have at this point of time are, how do frequencies become attenuated or phase shifted through the digital filter? And why are some frequencies affected more than others? 
These are some of the questions that we'll try to answer in the following videos to come. I'll see you there.